Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms. I wanna know you, I wanna find you in every season, in every moment. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart. There is one God and only one God. This one God exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. He is eternal and sovereign, co-equal with the Father and Son. He searches. He knows the truth. He is the truth. He testifies and empowers. He convicts the world of sin so that you and I experience an outflow for real. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong today. As always, it's our joy and delight to come your way and bring God's word to you and spend this time uh, ministering and sharing and praying with you. Uh, we trust that this series that we've been doing on the Holy Spirit has been enriching to your life as we uh, uh, continue on this journey. Uh, uh, we've uh, repeated uh, uh, our intent here as to uh, you know, what we uh, seek to achieve as we uh, discuss, as we learn about the person of the Holy Spirit. First of all, we want to learn how to yield ourselves more to Him so that, he could actually, uh, so that we could make ourselves available 
uh, to Him. Uh, we want to learn how to grow in our fellowship, in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And we also want to grow in our partnership and our working together with the Spirit of God in our life and ministry. And so uh, these are objectives we're trying to achieve as we learn and understand more and more of the Holy Spirit. I want you to pursue these objectives in prayer for your own personal life, that you begin to pray, you begin to talk to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you more and more. Lord, less of me, more of you in my life. And you begin to pray that way and yield yourself more and more to the Holy Spirit. That you begin to fellowship with Him. You begin to talk to Him. You begin to commune with Him. And you say, Holy Spirit, I realize that you're able to do this. And I've learned that you're able to do that. And, and Holy Spirit, I know you can work like this. So work that way in me, Holy Spirit. You begin to talk to Him. You have a constant communion with Him, that fellowship relationship with Him. Uh, you talk to Him about your own feelings, your own emotions. And you try and be sensitive to the emotions of the Spirit of God. That you say, Holy Spirit, how are, what do you feel? And you're, you're, you're being sensitive to his emotions. And so the, what, what's happening is you're now building that fellowship, that relationship with the Spirit of God. And also learning to develop your partnership with the Holy Spirit. As you begin to do things, you say, Holy Spirit, I will ask you for your empowering. Holy Spirit, I pray you come and anoint this work. I pray that you will flow through me as I do this. And so what, what you're actually saying is, Lord, I want to partner with you. I don't want to do this on my own. I don't want to do this by my own ability, but I want to do it in partnership. I make myself as a vehicle through which whom you will work. On the episode today, I want to talk about, uh, we want to do a quick survey, a little overview of the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Um, the book of Acts begins, of course, with, with, the, with the powerful work of the Holy Spirit and goes on through uh, till the very end, uh, the last chapter of the book of Acts. But we're going to touch upon a few highlights, a few things that I'd just like to highlight out of the book of Acts. It's in, it's the, in, in its entirety, it is, the rec it is a record of the works of the Holy Spirit uh, through um, the early church. Uh, the book of Acts begins, of course, with the Lord Jesus promising uh, his disciples that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to point out something here. You know, in John 20, verse 22, when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, right after that, he still told them, you need to wait for something more. So why would he do this? Because when he said, breathe on them, when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, that was the very first time the Spirit of God came into their spirit and they were born again. People could not be born again until after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that was the time when his disciples were born again. But now he told them, you need something more. You need to wait in Jerusalem. You need what he called as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1 and verse 5, Jesus tells his disciples, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit a few days from now. So he's saying, look, something's going to happen to you. And it's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he tells them why, what's going to happen. In verse 8 of Acts 1, he says, you're going to receive power. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and on to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's Acts 1 verse 8. So this baptism of the Holy Spirit would fill his disciples with the power they needed to be a witness. Now, you know, if, if Jesus said, you're going to receive knowledge to be a witness, then what would you expect them to do? You'd expect them to talk a lot and express that knowledge. But he didn't say you'll receive knowledge to be my witness. He said you'll receive power to be my witness. So what do you expect now? You expect them to demonstrate that power. Power, it must be demonstrated. That's the only way you would know there is power. So this, what Jesus was talking about, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is an impartation of divine power into earthen vessels like you and me. So that supernatural power can now be demonstrated through our lives. Uh, and the power of God can be released, demonstrated. People can see and know uh, that, that Jesus Christ is alive. So it's by the demonstration of the power that he wants us to be his witnesses to the very ends of the earth. So here you have these apostles um, uh, and the disciples, the believers, about 120 of them, are waiting in the upper room. And it was on the day of Pentecost. It was one of those feasts of Israel. Israel were, at that time was celebrating seven main feasts. Pentecost was one of them. It was a feast of the harvest, the harvest festival. And you know, these feasts of the Lord are very are divine moments when God meets with his people. 
And that's, a reason, that's one of the reasons why he instituted those feasts, for, them, for people to encounter him and for, for experience and, and, and meet with him. So on this day of Pentecost, when literally thousands of Jewish people have moved into Jerusalem to celebrate this feast, on that, month, on that particular day, the Spirit of God is poured out. The Bible talks about this um, uh, in Acts 2, that there's a, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, tongues of fire descended on these uh, believers, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. Now Peter stands up, and uh, of course there's a crowd around the upper room on the streets. They all gather. They're wondering what's going on. Uh, Peter stands up, and he begins to explain to them that this is what was prophesied by Joel. Uh, in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, Joel foretold that their time would come in the last days when, when God will pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. So Peter stands up there in, in, in the upper room and, and to this big audience of people standing outside. He tells them, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says, what you're seeing happen now is what Joel foretold, that we would speak, uh, that all of these things would happen. The Spirit of God being poured out. What I want to highlight here at this moment is, you know, Joel foretold that the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. Peter says, what you're seeing happen here is the very thing that Joel foretold. However, when you look very closely at the signs, they don't match. Joel said, uh, you know, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. On my handmaidens and my servants, I'll pour out my spirit. So he talked about visions and he talked about dreams. In the upper room, nobody was having a vision. Nobody was having a dream. Instead, there was a sound of a wind. There, were fire, there was tongues of fire. And there was speaking in other tongues. So when you look at these two uh, passages and the signs that were foretold by Joel, they don't seem to match. And yet the Holy Spirit says, this is that. It's important for us to understand that, there are t that uh, the moves of the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is moving, He's not going to always necessarily replicate the same signs. It is His work, it's His move, but we shouldn't just be caught up with you know, the same signs being replicated all the time. The Holy Spirit can move as He wishes, but we must be able to recognize that this is genuine, uh, genuine move of the Holy Spirit. This is what He is doing. Uh, let's receive it. Let's welcome it. The signs could be different. The demonstrations could be different. The manifestations could be varied because the Holy Spirit is not locked into you know, just two or three or four manifestations. He can manifest His presence in so many different ways. We must remain open to the manifestations, recognize that it is actually the Holy Spirit moving and welcome His work. Now, one thing that I do want to point out in Acts, the second chapter, is this. In Acts 2, uh, verse 38 and 39, as Peter explains what is happening, the phenomena that's taking place, Peter says, uh, he tells the audience, he tells them, repent, he preaches Jesus to them, and he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, it's to your children, it's to those who are far away, and it's for as many as the Lord our God will call. So Peter is saying, you know, all of you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for everyone whom the Lord our God will call. Meaning that this, that promise is available to all of us today. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available for all of us today. Because Peter said, it's for as many as the Lord our God will call. It includes you and I who are being called by the Lord. Now in Acts, the fourth chapter, uh, we see something very interesting happen. We see, uh, you know, when, when Peter and John, after, this was after the healing of the lame man, when Peter and John are uh, taken up by the, uh, the, the city, um, the, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin and the council, they're brought there and they are threatened, uh, saying, you know, we do not want you to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. Uh, and, and they're released. Um, and uh, Peter and John go back to the rest of the disciples and they tell them, you know, this is what happened. They threatened us, they told us not to preach and teach. In the name of Jesus, uh, these disciples gather together and they pray. In Acts 4, 38, 39, it says, you know, they prayed. They, say, they said, Lord, uh, look at their threatenings, but you give us boldness. Uh, you give us boldness, God, to preach your word. And you stretch out your hand to heal and let signs and wonders be done in the name of your son, Jesus. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, once again, they were filled afresh with the Spirit of God, 
And it says the place where they were praying was shaken. And they were filled with the, with the Spirit. They were filled with boldness to preach the Word. So here you see a different kind of a manifestation. In Acts 2, there was a son of a wind. Here, the place was shaken. There was actually something moving. It, was like, it seemed like the whole building was, uh, there was like earthquake or a tremor that the place was shaken. And they were filled with boldness. A different kind of a manifestation. But the same Holy Spirit moving uh, through his people. Now, in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, uh, we read about a situation. Now, this is, the, you know, the church in Jerusalem is growing. It may have grown to about 10,000, possibly 20,000 believers now. And, uh, the, you know, there's a lot of work to be done taking care of these people. Uh, part of the work that was done was that daily they would distribute food to all the people to eat. And uh, uh, there was a problem in this big, big congregation. Uh, they were the uh, Greek-speaking Jews, and they were the, the Hebrew-speaking Jews. And, and uh, although they were Jews, they spoke different languages. Uh, and there was this clash between them. You know, they felt, the, they felt that uh, some of the, their widows were not being treated fairly in the distribution of the food. And so the, when the problem arose, the apostles said, you know, let's find seven men. You find seven men from among you. And these men were going to serve the food. They were going to be put in charge of distributing the food properly and equally among all the people. So they said, we're going to put these seven men in charge of food distribution. But notice the requirements of these seven men. Uh, the apostles said, find us seven men who are of good report. That means they, are, they have a good testimony among you. And who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. You know, they wanted men who are full of the Holy Spirit. Even to do a very simple thing as distribute food, they were looking for people who were completely yielded to the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about what it means to be baptized and what it means to be filled with the Spirit in a, in a future episode. But I want to point this, I want to highlight this, that even in a, such a simple matter as distributing food to the people, the apostles' requirement was you find seven men who've got a good testimony and who are filled with the, with the Holy Spirit, who are full of wisdom. And, and they found these seven men. They, they, they came and brought them forth, and um, the apostles prayed for them and appointed them uh, to carry out the daily distribution of food. It tells us something that even in, uh, in our day-to-day -day activities, in the things we do, simple things we do, we must learn to be yielded to the Holy Spirit and learn to do the very things we do in dependence and in partnership with the Holy Spirit. So it really doesn't matter, you know, what you do, uh, what, you're, uh, what you do as in your vocation, what you may be doing in your life uh, or in your ministry. Learn to always be filled with the Spirit and do your work out of that, out of the empowering and in partnership that the Holy Spirit brings. Don't think, you know, well, what I'm doing is in that spiritual, uh, so I don't need the Holy Spirit to help me or empower me. No. Even in a matter as simple as distributing food, the requirement was find us men who are full of the Holy Spirit. So there's no work that is too simple or too ordinary, but the Holy Spirit does not want to be involved. Open up your life and everything you do, say, Holy Spirit, fill me, empower me. Uh, I want to work with you in doing what I'm called to do. In um, Acts, the uh, eighth chapter, uh, we have... Uh, 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 an interesting account of uh, Philip. He goes down into the city of uh, Samaria and uh, he preaches Jesus to them. Uh, and many people believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they give their lives to Jesus. Uh, and uh, they are baptized in water, uh, which means that they are you know, definitely believers. They have def made a very definite decision to follow Jesus Christ and they are saved. But what we see is in Acts 8, a very interesting thing. That when Peter and John, when the apostles in Jerusalem hear that Samaria have received the word, they send to them Peter and John. And Peter and John come down to these um, believers in Samaria. And it tells us there in Acts 8, um, verse 20, that they pray for them that they might be filled with the Holy Spirit because he had not yet fallen upon them. They were only being baptized in the name of Jesus. So it tells us here that as a practice in the early church. After people had made their decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they also prayed for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit or to be baptized with the Spirit or to have the Spirit poured out upon them 
like the apostles and other disciples experienced on the day of Pentecost. So it was a normal practice. So you're a believer. You've made a decision to follow Jesus. You love the Lord. Okay, that's great. You're saved. You're definitely going to go to heaven. That's true. You're born again. You're born of the Spirit. That's wonderful. But you need to be prayed for that you may be baptized in the Holy Spirit or you may be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you may have the Spirit of God poured out upon you. And it was a practice in the early church, as you can see uh, by this record in Acts chapter 8. And we have several other records of the working of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. I just want to highlight a few things here. In Acts chapter 10, we have Peter, who goes to the house of Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And for the very first time, the gospel is proclaimed to the Gentiles. And there in Acts 10, while Peter is just speaking to, the, uh, to the Cornelius and his household, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So in one instant, they are saved and they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak in other tongues and, and magnify God. And Peter and his, and, his, and his Jewish friends are all amazed at what happens. In Acts 13, we see it is the Holy Spirit who speaks to the elders in the, of the church in Antioch and says, separate me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work I've called them. So the Holy Spirit calls people into specific areas of ministry and, and, uh, in, and what they're called to do. In Acts 16, verses 6 to 10, we see the Holy Spirit forbidding Paul from going into Asia or Amasia, uh, uh, and he directs uh, and he gives him a vision to go over into Thessalonica. So, so the Holy Spirit is our director in the ministry, in the work of the ministry, in what we do. He tells us, you know, don't go there. You don't need to go there. Go to this place. So we must learn to be yielded and dependent upon uh, the Holy Spirit and, and, and the work He's calling us to do. Um, there's, of course, a lot more uh, in the book of Acts. I'll close with this in Acts 20 and verse 28. Uh, as Paul is speaking to the leaders from Ephesus, he tells them, you know, take heed to yourselves and to the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Feed the flock of God. So he says, you know, the Holy Spirit has set you in a position of leadership, has made you overseers, spiritual overseers, to look over the, the, the people of God. So it is really the Holy Spirit who appoints people to oversee in, in positions of spiritual leadership, to oversee God's people, to shepherd them, to feed them, to nurture them. And he continues to do these things today. When God moves in an unusual way, the dead come back to life. There is power in his visitation and a mighty outpouring in his habitation, bringing a revival in our churches and our ministry. All People's Church presents Get ready to host revivals, visitations, and moves of God. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today as we try to do a quick overview of the book of Acts and, and look at the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We were able to touch upon a, a few things. There's, of course, a lot more in the book of Acts uh, that reveal to us uh, about the work of the Holy Spirit. But I hope these things have stimulated your thinking and also inspired your faith for you to believe God personally for your own self, to move into higher levels and dimensions and work of the Holy Spirit. There is so much more. The Spirit of God as a person is infinite. And so we can press into Him more and more and experience more and more of His presence and His power and His working. So let's pray together and ask for more um, uh, before we close today. Holy Spirit, we thank You for the work You've done and we just ask for more of you. And I pray right now, Lord, for those watching, that they will experience more of you, that they will experience more of your working. Oh God, dislocate wrong ideas, wrong thoughts, and open up their hearts and minds to receive more of you, Holy Spirit, I pray. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And until next time, remember, live life to Jesus' name. I have a calling to be salt and light. I'm part of a family that empowers me to fulfill this commission. I have a job. 
but then I was always passionate to study the word. We are students from different walks of life. My potential is best tapped in an environment like this. Where I get the opportunity to reach out and to minister. A culture where there's supernatural impartation through anointed leaders. I can now aim for excellence because that is God's beautiful design. I am equipped to impact. Come. Discover. Fulfill. Admissions are now open for the academic year for the short-term courses starting October 2016. For inquiries about the course and other details, please do get in touch with us on our toll-free number 1-800-300-00998, mobile number 99457-0977 or landline number 080-6561-0823. You can also email us at contact at apcwo.org. You can download the application form from our website apcwo.org slash Bible College. We invite you to visit our church website www.apcwo.org where we provide several free resources including mp3 sermons, sermon notes and free publications that you can download and use. You can also call, email or write to us to request your free printed copy of our publications. Please feel free to share your comments and prayer requests when you contact us.